Um, I really appreciate all the talks this morning, and I, I really look forward to the talks that were that they're going to come tomorrow. Um, and you all should really appreciate how hard I had to twist all the developers' arms to make you give to make them give you those demos. They do not like public speaking, so thank you, devs, for that. Um, I know it's not often that I ask you to come talk, but I, I think everybody got a lot of value out of those demonstrations. I, I actually debated when, when I should talk about the OpenMDO roadmap. Um, I don't know how many of you actually saw it out on the website before you came today. Um, I think I promised I'd publish it two weeks ahead of time, so I published it two days ahead of time, right on schedule. Um, in the end, I decided that going at the end of the first day was, was good because I wanted to make sure you guys got a chance to, to give me your, to give us your feedback sort of un, unfiltered by the view of what I'm about to say. Uh, so I kind of split the difference and went at the end of the first day. But, but that being said, I, I feel that hopefully what you'll see in this roadmap does at least start to address a lot of the concerns you guys have raised. Um, let me start by saying what this roadmap is and what it's not. It's intended to tell you guys our development priorities. It's explicitly not meant to be like the opening of a decision by committee process. Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, we're answerable to the NASA projects that are funding us, specifically T cubed and getting a lot of support from RVLT and AATT. And we're gonna end up having to focus on, on their needs first above all else. So just to be clear, this is not like a, a voting process, right? Um, NASA will remain the benevolent or not so benevolent, depending on your perspective, perhaps dictator of the project. But that being said, there's a, there's a lot of value that comes to this project from this feedback. Uh, not just making sure that you guys can use it, that's a stated goal, NASA gets benefit from disseminating its technology. But also your perspectives and your feedback often help us see pain points that maybe we were ignoring or working around. And a lot of times you have really good ideas or contributions to fix problems, right? There's a number of people in this room who have commits in the repo. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't think there's a better feeling than when I get a pull request that fixes a bug that I didn't know existed, other than the fact that there was a bug. That's not great, but, but that somebody fixed it and I don't have to worry about it is awesome. Um, so the value to the community from our perspective, our being the development team, is, is clear. And we really don't want to do anything that would specifically lessen the value of OpenMDO to you guys if we can avoid it. So to that end, I think I will personally commit to publishing an annual roadmap, probably November of each year, maybe November, December timeframe works well for us. And it might end up being more of a living document. I'm not gonna like nail down a specific process, but I think that this is a good way for us to communicate our development priorities and to open up a period of communication where whether it's at this workshop or, or not, you guys can say, well, did you think about this? Or, or if enough people say like, hey, you forgot about the automatic cupcake generator, OpenMDO really needs to make cupcakes and it's not making cupcakes and everybody wants it to make cupcakes. And maybe if enough of the community feels like cupcakes are really important, then maybe we'll do it. Uh, maybe, right? So um, I think that this is the start. This is my attempt at the start of a process for how you guys can ask us to make cupcakes. So these are the four high level topics that we're, or areas that we're planning to focus on. This is not an, inclu uh, an like an all inclusive list. There'll be other stuff, obviously bug fixes and performance enhancements. But in terms of top line features and where the majority of our development focus is gonna be, um, and, and I should clarify, this is a framework development resources, not necessarily our application development resources. Chris, that one's specifically for you. So we can have a side discussion about, about that. Um, so a lot of the stuff that like Eric talked about or stuff in terms of development of Dymos features, that's a separate sort of development roadmap. Uh, and I would argue that those projects are young enough now that I'm not comfortable planning a year out at the moment for those. But in terms of framework development, what the core dev team, basically the folks who you heard talk today what we're doing, that's what this document is about. So the first one, releasing OpenMDO v3. And I know every time I've incremented the number in the past, it's been a complete rewrite. I want to assure you before I go any farther, that's not what this is. So Gary, you can relax. Um, v3 will not be a complete rewrite. 
Uh, model and data visualization, uh, as you could tell by the, some of the demos that we chose to show you, is, in my opinion, weirdly an area that we need to start focusing on. Um, it's not something that any of us are particularly trained for, but I think OpenMDO has reached the point where the complexity of the models that it enables you to create is great enough that we need to spend time helping you create those very complex models and do so correctly. Um, I think you already mentioned this. I think Garrett, maybe it was in your talk, but the need, so like AD is cool, our analytic derivatives are cool, and I think you all believe me that they're a five billion times faster and you should never use a gradient-free algorithm ever again, right? Everybody can, can just stipulate that. Um, but the reality of the situation is that computing derivatives is not, like for a legacy tool, maybe not viable. Even for a new tool that you're developing, still a lot of work. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if it's a lot of work if, you know, as over time your engineers choose not to add derivatives and the amount of code that's differentiated is going down, that's an indication to me that we need to do some work in that area. And in fact, um, I've seen how much effort it takes to maintain the derivatives in code, right? Just like superficially, you know that there's like something like quadratically, the number of lines of code you wrote is the number of derivatives you have to write. That's not a, like raising quadratic number of lines of code is a bad trend. Um, now, it's not like, there aren't people, it's not like there aren't solutions out there. AD is the obvious solution. Complex step is another one, uh, even efficient finite difference. Um, however, it's also been pointed out that Python's AD support is kind of weak. And OpenMDO makes that, Python in general makes AD hard, and then OpenMDO makes things both a little bit harder and a little bit easier. So that's an area where I actually think it'll be active research for us to figure out whether we can make an AD tool that's robust enough that let's say 80% of the time it works, that, that would be an accomplishment, I would think. Um, but more importantly, make sure that when it doesn't work, you know, right? Like, oh, the AD didn't work. Uh, I think that's probably the most important factor of it. Uh, so, and then lastly, what I actually hope to spend most of our discussion on, although I'm open to talking about any of this, is our new community contribution process. And, and maybe that's not even the right name for it because I, I think it should really be called our new process for describing and getting input from, for describing to and getting input from the community what we're doing in terms of API, right? Changing the API, adding functionality, things like that. So um, why don't we do this? Why don't I go through the roadmap and at, at the end, if you guys think I've missed like a crucially important topic, and you want to bring it up amongst everybody, let's have that discussion. If you want to talk to me about it after the fact, that's fine too. All right, so OpenMDO v3. Uh, really, I would say that this is a somewhat minor update, but it's the, the most important thing in v3 is that we're going to be dropping support for Python 2.x. Why? Well, NumPy and SciPy are dropping support in January, so if they can do it, I can too. <laughs> um, it, it will make our lives a little bit easier, lower our development overhead, even if it's just a small amount. Anything I can do to do that is worthwhile for the development team. And it let us use some more funky, you know, some more advanced Python 3 features that are valuable, like specifically format strings I'd love to be able to use. Um, does, does anybody in this room object to dropping Python? I, I'm probably still going to do it, but I'm curious if any of you object to dropping Python 2 support. Raise your hand if you object. Awesome, great, all right. The second thing that we're hoping to do with v3 is get rid of, so we've tried to not break the API. We, we've failed. There's been a number of times where we've made small tweaks to the API that are backwards incompatible. I hope you agree they're small, maybe you don't. They're nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but we've tried wherever we could to deprecate the old functionality, whether that's changing the name of an option or a function. Like we recently changed the om command thing from view model to n2. There's a reason we did that. View model never really made any sense, but also we have a bunch of new visualization tools that were named after their functionality. And so it made sense to kind of bring that in line. But we deprecated view model, so you can still call view model, right? And the same with the Python function itself. Well, there's a, there's a lot of deprecation throughout the code now, and we'd like to sort of get rid of that and start a new pile of deprecations <laughs> without the weight of the old ones. So those are the two things that are, that are mainly, the main two things that are going into V3, plus whatever bug fixes and small feature improvements have already made it into the code since 2.9.1. Um, so that's the plan. Hopefully January 2020, that may slip a little bit, but not much more than that. That's, that's the goal. 
Um, I, I think it's a good thing for OpenMDO, and, and I think moving forward in the future, that kind of a like cadence, like we'll, we'll change for we'll change to v4 the next time we decide to get rid of all the deprecations kind of thing, right? Or the next time we have to yeah. drop support for Python 3 because we're going to Python 4, not because we're going to another programming language. Um, I think Andrew would like us to rewrite everything. Andrew Ning would like us to rewrite everything in Julia, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Comments on this section. You guys okay with this? Happy? Unhappy? You want me to keep deprecations in there forever? Silence has taken his tacit approval. Okay. Disrule. What's that? Kiss rule. rule? Keeping it simple. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. Kiss rule. Right. Um, yeah. So I guess, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I, I, like I said, I've tried to keep old functionality in place. We also tried something new recently with the Noon Solver. I'm planning to make a small tweak to the API and I've put a deprecation and warning in there to warn you about it. Um, this particular tweak is worth discussing. The, the default behavior of the Noon Solver does not um, call what's solve subsystems. I don't know how many of you get into the details of our Noon Solver, but it turns out that like pretty much 99% of people should be using solve systems and should at least have a bounds enforcing line search on their Newton Solver. The first thing I do whenever I sit down with somebody's model is turn on solve subsystems and add a bounds enforcing line search. So I kind of just want to make those the default. They're not the default now though, so if I change it, I'll break your model if you were relying on the old behavior. Um, I, I'm so afraid of doing that at this point. I, I mean like kind of in deference to kind of the stuff that Garrett talked about in his talk that I legitimately don't know if you guys would prefer. Again, I'll probably do what I want anyway, but I, I would like your input. I, I don't know if you'd prefer if I keep this bad default or change it. So at the moment, what we did was we threw a deprecation warning in and said, we're going to change this in 3.0, change this default. Warning, warning, warning. Um, you don't have to worry if you make the default a switchable on and off. Uh, you can change it. So like, you mean like if I allow people to? If you change the default, if you don't feel bad, then you just give us the opportunity to turn it off. Well, that's fine, but that's fine as long as you explicitly set the options you want. But if you were relying on the defaults, I just changed your model behavior and now your model doesn't converge or it converges and takes 15 times longer and you don't know why. Um, but if the defaults, old default is there as a, a radio oh, button, the new, the new default is a radio button. I see. You want to be able to choose. Well, no, I don't, but maybe somebody else. Does. We could talk about that, but. The problem is it's really hard to know when you want to change one of these defaults a priori, and you're just going to end up with like this creep of like incremental changes in defaults. But yeah, potentially allowing you some kind of an option to keep the old defaults when we do that kind of a thing might, might be doable. The dev team has this word for that we call user preferences, and every time somebody says it, I get angry and stomp out of the room. <laughs> um, Brett's giving me nasty looks from the back of the room already. So, but. I mean, you guys can give us give us some thought and, and give us some input. Yeah, Sham. Um, most, the way the math of our Newton solver works is a little bit weird. I, I know you know this, but for everybody else's benefit. But most people actually expect the behavior to be closer to solve subsystems. Because like if they were using nested Newton solvers in say MATLAB, the behavior they get, or, or model center, the behavior they get is with solved subsystems turned on. So that's that's one reason is that, like I had a conversation with Ben and I was like, oh, do you have solved subsystems turned on? And, and he didn't realize he did have it turned on probably because he copied the model from Yasa or something, but he didn't even know that OpenMDO was doing this weird mathematical thing. And then when you turn sub solved subsystems off that you're basically solving a monolithic Newton system of like, you're, it just didn't even register, right? But he understood what was going on, or he, what was going on was what he expected because solve subsystems was on. So that's that's one reason. The other reason is it's usually slower, but a lot more stable. Um, usually, usually, and I would prefer that be the preference, or that that be the default state, and that like, you know, you you can speed it up if you want, but at least you actively made the decision to make things less stable and faster. Um, and I guess the third reason is, like I said, like. 90% of the time somebody comes in my office and they're like, I can't get this Newton solver to work. And I turn on solve subsystems and add a bounds enforcing line search and it works. So if, I, if that's like my initial step for debugging, 
you know, and like twice a week I have to do that. Uh, even sometimes for like experienced applications users who should know better, but like they have 37 Newton solvers in there, like layered in their code and they just missed one. It seems to me that that's the right thing to do. Uh, but like if every person in this room universally told me I was dumb and I was making a mistake, I'd probably reconsider. <laughs> or even if most people in the room told me that. Ah, uh, but I have a proof that shows that the solved subsystems is mathematically correct too. <laughs> it wasn't correct. Oh. Oh, in version that was back in version one of Open Arrowstruct. Okay, so the the comment for the internet is that there was an old this function existed in OpenMDO version one, and I now I vaguely remember we ran into a situation where. The converged answer was different whether you had solved subsystems on or not. And for that particular problem, there really should have only been one answer. Um, I, I would regard that as a bug that needs to be fixed. Uh, OK. You're the only one. <laughs> no. I. So that's the problem, right, with the default. But so when you say completely explicit, like it's an error if you did not choose one of those. Like the default state is unchosen, which will throw an error. Maybe you write your at least in the documentation. I see. But nobody reads the docs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so. So this is like a really good example, right? I, I'm being a little bit contrarian here. I'm channeling Ken. Ken, Ken disagrees with everything on principle. Um, but, but I'm never like, OpenMDO is so broad, I'm always gonna have disagreements between different users as to what they expect the behavior to be. My sort of broad philosophy is to swing with the majority, I guess. Um, but, I, but I respect your, your viewpoint of like, look, the. The nested Newton is weird. It's not like Newton's method is taught to me. I don't understand what's going on. I push back with, not necessarily to you, but like, well, you say that to me, but then the way you're using it is actually closer to, the, to what we've implemented and you just didn't realize it. Um, but I mean, this is like, I think one of the hardest challenges of this project is when we, you know, everybody wants something slightly different as their default environment. Um, so, at this very moment, I am still planning to change that default in version three. However, I, I actually do think that maybe you and I could sit down and look at the docs and, and make it more clear exactly what's going on, make it very explicit. Or maybe we need to consider forcing you to actually set, right? Like the default state is unset and you must choose one or the other uh, or you get an error. Maybe, maybe that's a better solution um, for that particular option, yeah. More than the release notes. And I don't know how that works because it's tough to go through the release notes of each and every individual one and say, okay, we're going to include this in this feature. I don't care about that right now. I care about what's working on model. We have a section in release notes for backwards incompatible API changes and new API changes. I understand. I want to okay. minimize the amount of work that the user has to do such that I can say 2.4 or 3.1, here are all the backwards incompatible changes in one spot. That, that is in the release notes. Right. Oh, oh, wait, 2.4 to 3, like from any arbitrary version to any other arbitrary version? Yeah, I'm working on release notes. Okay. It works for this version. Okay. And we haven't changed for a while. I see. So it's about to eliminate 3.1 or something, and you need to figure out everything that could be good. Okay. It's actually a really good idea that I have no idea how to implement. So I did it with like a, I don't know. Are you talking about like parsing the release notes and like just aggregating all the API changes between two versions? Okay. All right. You want to get run that on your model? 
Yeah. No, 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 no. No. Ken, you are banned from suggesting features ever again. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Adding the change notes in the doc string. Okay. I mean, it's sailed for, I'm not going back, but I, I could adopt it going forward. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments on versioning issues? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I sometimes jokingly say that rule number one of writing docs is nobody will read your docs. And rule number two of writing docs is it doesn't matter. You have to write good docs anyway. Uh, I, I don't honestly think we've succeeded. I think our docs are okay. Um, I actually think your Garrett's assessment of like our docs are probably use, usable for advanced users and don't really help somebody come up the learning curve is, is an accurate statement. I, I don't have good ideas for how to fix that, but, I, but I'd be open to suggestions and I would be willing to devote time and energy of our development team to fix that. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I do think they're okay for advanced users, but I, I think that like they don't, like somebody who doesn't know anything about open MDO and MDO and optimization sits down, right? And it's like, where do I start, right? Like, so yeah. But you had you had several key advantages like fundamentally understanding analytic derivatives and working with like yeah. Our, our docs are usable. They're definitely usable. But I mean, and the search function functionality has gotten a lot better recently. But I don't know. I think NumPy I, and and it's NumPy in some ways has an easier job than us because they're just a library. But I think like NumPy's docs, where you just like Google, how do you do this in NumPy, and then it like magically shows you the answer is like where I would love to be. But I, I need more people to post more links on Google so that they index our. I, I I appreciate that you guys think our docs are good. For this audience, I think they are good, right? Like most of you are active users of the framework, um, but I have seen folks struggle to like come up the learning curve enough that the structure of the docs makes sense and they know how to navigate and like find features and stuff. So, so maybe it's fair to say like they're okay, but they really, at least at the low end of the learning curve could be better. Right. So, so that's actually a really good point that like early on, there's this confluence of like maybe learning Python, learning the specifics of OpenMDO, object oriented programming, and then like broad concepts of optimization in general. Um, I'll tell you the reason that I'd be willing to at least work with the community to like write better docs that would help people come up that learning curve. I mean, we hire a lot of people and we bring a lot of people in. And so if I didn't have to personally teach them how to use OpenMDO, that would save me a lot of time. And so. There's a, there's, it's worthwhile for me to invest in like helping people come up that learning curve, but we're never gonna like replace UCSD or University of Michigan's like labs that train people on being experts in optimization. I can't, I'm not even gonna, it's, there's no point. What about enrolling some of those professors and asking them to like create a Coursera class and you just say, hey, go take this class at Coursera if you really need to learn. It's a, it's a really good idea. How many professors do you know that write code anymore? So they would just throw it back on me, right? But like, but maybe I should create a Coursera course, yeah. Uh, right. Right. So, so maybe that's maybe that's the solution. Is we need like before you go to Open MDO, you need to learn some stuff that's like independent of our framework. Uh, 
I'm going to, yeah, yeah. If you use that word adjoint, people who don't like optimization run out of the room screaming. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the pushback I sometimes get, and there's not much I can do about this, is they'll say like, well, I don't have to learn everything about optimization to use MATLAB, so I'll just use MATLAB and like fmincon solves my problem, right? But okay, for 20 variables, now solve for 200, go. <laughs> In the past, our code base changed enough that it wasn't worth the time to do the webinars, but I, I think hopefully it's, hopefully it's stable enough now that those will be worthwhile. So I, I think we'll probably do some more of that. Andrew, you, you had something, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. I was just that someone said I think that's the goal. That's the goal moving forward is to pr produce the software in such a way that you can at least know what's going to break in the current version that you're at. Hmm. Right. Right. So there's a there's a slight downside to like being a little bit more rigorous about API changes, and that's that it will slow the development of like fixes and features. Um, the sense, the clear sense that I got from a lot of you is that that trade is worth making at this point, or at least some degree of that trade, right? Like. Maybe extensions to the API, those can clearly come in, kind of trickle. They don't hurt people, but changes to the API need to be warned um, and give you guys some time to adjust ahead of time. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where my head is at. It, it will add some development overhead to us, and it'll probably lead to some times where somebody wants something fixed, and I tell you, you have to pull from a specific branch of OpenMDO because I'm not pushing it to master. So it'll also make a little bit more overhead for you if you're not super comfortable with Git, but it sounds to me like that's clearly where we're at here. So I think that's what we have to go to. Uh, like the type hinting stuff? Yeah. We haven't. Yeah, so to be honest with you, we just haven't spent a lot of time with that stuff because we've always been carrying Python 2 support. So that is something that we, we would like to look at. I think somebody from GTRI, I think, actually. I think they were from GTR commented on that on our on our roadmap already. Uh, Nick, yeah, or I, I think it might have been Brian something, but um, but yeah. So looking at using some of that static typing stuff is is something that we'll definitely take a look at once we have the time and the the freedom to do it because we don't have to carry backward support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll have to see how it shakes out. Then so it, it sounds like people kind of want it both ways. Like people want to always have the latest and greatest content from OpenMDAO, but they also don't want to have to change any of their dependencies. So it's I, I think we're being we we may be being a little bit too cautious about making backward compatible minor changes because with disciplined use of like virtual environments and dependency planning. It's not like OpenMDAO 1 or 2 went away. Like all that code is still available. So legacy models that already run with disciplined use of virtual environments and good development practices will always be able to run. Um, with the exception of like, if, if there's like big security flaws or like, like there ought to be a long-term support uh, version of, of 2, but I feel like a lot of the problem that people are experiencing with these version roles, especially the minor avoided through a little bit of back and forth about like we, we encourage the use of virtual environments and clean your dependencies. You don't just like if 
I don't. I actually don't think that we're that far off. I, I think everybody, in, in speaking for everybody, <laughs> um, it seems like everybody's okay with us making minor changes to the API as long as the path to adjust to those changes is clear. I, I think in the past, what happened, like, so what happened between version zero and version one is it is like a different universe. Like that's that's a different kind of change. But like, if I'm changing a default on Newton, right? It doesn't sound like anybody objects. Well. Doesn't sound like most people object to me changing that. Um, as long as it's clear that that's what changed and that they have some process to understand what changed so that when they want to upgrade their model from you know 2.9 to 3.0, they can figure out what, it's not just like, oh, well, it doesn't give me the right answer. What do I need to fix? Um, I think that's a reasonable request that we develop and modify the API in such a way that when we make those changes, there's some way that you can discover what they are, right? And it's probably gonna be a mix of deprecation and relying on the release notes, probably, but um, I, I think it's okay that if we know we're gonna push a change to the API, that we commit to pushing a change that warns about the deprecation before we get that in. I, I guess what I'm saying, if there's a change we're gonna make and it's technically feasible to raise a deprecation warning, right. then that shouldn't inhibit you from making I I agree with that, we will not, we will not stop progress for the purpose of like freezing the API. Um, there's still enough going on that we're sometimes, you know, we're just gonna have to do things better. Like the solve subsystems thing, it, you know, it's, it's clearly the way to go, but it's only very recent that I've been, in, I've been confident that that's probably the default behavior. I actually like the suggestion of forcing people to explicitly choose. So I think that's a good solution in that case, but you know, um, I am explicitly stating that we are still allowed to change the API even after 3.0. Uh, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I, I think it's just still gonna happen. But I, I'm also saying that, let's say 3.0 is out and we're about to push 3.1. I think a reasonable compromise is before we change the API, we push 3.0.5 that if we can, we give a deprecation warning if it's, if it's feasible. I, I don't think that that's unreasonable. Um, it does add a little bit more overhead to us, but but I think we our application, even application users at NASA, would benefit from that. So that that seems like a reasonable compromise to me. All right, executive decision. We're going to move on to model and data visualization, but I'm happy to continue the the API discussion with anybody who wants offline. So a lot of our a lot of our uh, demos today were about visualization. We've already talked about this in quite a bit. Um, I, I gave Eric a working model with like a single PyCycle instance and then he instantiated 50 of them. So that's kind of the arms race that we're dealing with. And then when you have to debug that model with 50 different instances running, it, it's pretty headache. So this is a value to us. Like our application team at NASA needs these tools. So, so we are our own users here. Uh, that being said, I think you guys are also, your input is really valuable. Um, so the first one you guys already saw, Metamodel Viewer, that has come up a number of times for our users, so we're gonna continue to develop that. I'm not super happy with the performance of that thing as it sits. Some of that is limited by the cost of the surrogate model itself. There might be some other things we can do. Um, I think the current implementation with Bokeh sounds like you guys are okay with that, with that online thing. Um, but at a high level, my opinion is that as much of our visualization as possible should actually be based on the case recorder so like what's been recorded um, for two reasons. One, I think, you know, it, you tend to have models that run a long time. And if you need that just to get to the point where you make a plot, that's really inefficient. Um, but two, again, portability, I think is really valuable. So I can send you a case record and then you can visualize it even if you don't have MPI installed and can't run my CFD code. Um, so the, the meta model viewer is already out. The, the prototype that you saw today is out in 2.9 that was noted in the release notes, I hope, pretty sure. Um, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know why that did that. Yeah. You can, gen right now you can generate an N2 directly from the model or from the case record. 
Yes, I, I think that'll still be the case. Yeah, yeah. That that N two so critical to using that I I sort of just need to make it as available as possible. So that one might ultimately end up being the exception of the rule or something like it'll just yeah. Um, but it has been has been valuable to be able to view it out of a case recorder, for example. Like I needed to look at somebody's model, but they've modified it, and so I wanted to look at it at the state that the data was generated. Um, so you guys saw the N2. It sounds like most of you had used it already, which is good to hear. You guys find value in that. Um, but I don't think it's controversial to say that the UI for that isn't great. It seems like the consensus from almost everybody I've talked to, both in this room and outside the room, is that we should do some combination of context menu and tool selection. So that's probably what we're going to go with, to be frank. Um, there's still a lot of work to do on that UI because we want to add a bunch more features, not just improve the performance, but make it easier to navigate, things like that. Uh, possibly look into linking the, the, ca um, the case recorder data so you could like click on variables and get their values at different cases and things like that. Um, possibly linking the N2 and the connection viewer if there's a, a UI connection that makes sense there. Um, I want to highlight this. We'll get to what this means in just a minute, but um, I think ultimately what we might end up doing is uh, either writing two different poems, which are going to be proposals for enhancement, uh, open MDO enhancements. Uh, so we'll probably end up writing two different poems, or maybe we've just down selected now, like with everybody's feedback, maybe we'll end up writing one poem. Um, before we settle on anything, we're basically going to publish a, like a prototype spec of what we're anticipating, hopefully with like much more detailed UI mockups than what you saw. And we'll probably let that percolate for a while, see what you guys think, see if people have better suggestions, even if it's just, here's a better icon for that tool. Um, but we're going to use this as a bit to test out this poem process, because it'll be a meaningful change to the UI of the N2. I don't know if you want to call that an API change or not. I think of it as an API change. It changes the way the user interacts with the tool. Um, and so before we actually do that, I'm going to give you guys some time to, to look at what we're proposing and if you, if you want to comment. And then I actually didn't, uh, I didn't remember that Tim was using Ovis. It was a prototype, so I'm, I'm glad that you're still using it. Uh, so it's cool that you guys got to see a, a, at least a screenshot of it. Um, I'd like to revive the work on Ovis. Maybe Electron is the right solution. Maybe Jupyter Notebooks are the right solution. But I think having like a data inspection tool that lets you dig into your model more efficiently is, is of value. Um, my primary question for you guys, and again, you can answer now or answer later, would you object to installing a separate application? Is that a problem? Uh, so yeah, John. I'm, I'm happy to take comments for the public, or if you want to talk about it with me after, that's fine too. Okay. Co I'll, comments for the room. Sure, I'll just say right now, I don't like it on the surface, okay. uh, especially if you're trying to use OpenMDO or OpenMDO applications where it's relatively naive to such as students. Okay. Um, so one thing would be like, it, it's very easy to say, just install OpenMDO. If you're going to get a content, et cetera, it, it should work okay. And the fact that it comes packaged with the end to it packaged with a few other things, I love that. And so if there's some way to do that, just delivering it as part of the native OpenMDO package running natively in Python. And I don't need to go that far, but a one-stop shop for downloading everything, and if you can install it as well, then that's great. OK. Yeah, I would second that, because if you're working in a corporate environment where cybersecurity is everything, and so every single piece of software that comes along, you have to get separate approval, it can take months. So already, you know, I had to get like seven different things that Would you trade functionality for simplicity of install? Would you explicitly make that trade? Like if, if instead of a nice integrated OVIS, where I'm, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic perhaps, but instead of all the tools talking to each other, each one just became a standalone tool that didn't link to the others? Really, what matters, and even if it's just 
I see. All right, so from an IT perspective, we have to pretend it's one code, even if it's separate codes. Exactly. Right. That doesn't address John's issue of dumb students, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Santiago. Do the visualization, you mean? Okay. No, if there's a tool that can do 75% of what we need, and especially if we can augment that, I, I would use it. I don't know of those tools, so tell me them. <laughs> Feed me. <laughs> So we are using Plotly in Ovis already. So like we're using the libraries. The problem is you have to like link those libraries to the structure of your data and make it so that it's quick to access it. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. You don't want to add, like, I got you, I got you. Right. Okay, so can't be a separate installer, must be pretend to be a single project, but optional install, so you don't want to adopt that. Got it, got it. <laughs> cupcakes, cupcake, cupcakes. Yeah. No, I, listen, I think all of these are, like, I, there's some intersection of this, which is the solution we have to, we have to get to, right? But, okay, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the Electron application that we developed was basically just like download it and click on it. Um, was the, like, that was it. But um, I would hope that your users could do that, but, but that may be asking too much, I don't know. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe there's a clear need for at least key visualizations to remain just command line arguments that, that work. And, Um, okay, so I think, you know, mainly driven by some of the work that Eric and Rob have been leading, I, I'm, not that I really needed a lot of convincing, but that this was a good idea, but I'm convinced that this has risen to the level of worth our effort to satisfy NASA's needs, which is we, we'd like to try to add some new features to make coming up with derivatives easier. Even if that means like the entire, pro like the runtime maybe is slower, but if my, my human time is reduced, that's, that's a trade I'm willing to make. Um, so we talked about it very briefly. I think you'll see a demo of it tomorrow, the, but we have this partial derivative coloring functionality, which is very, very useful for particularly for models that you might build with Dimos, uh, which tend to have like a diagonal structure to their Jacobian. So you can kind of finite difference all the inputs at the same time. Uh, so we already have a prototype implementation of this based on the same graph coloring algorithm that we use for our total derivatives. Uh, so it's already there. You can already try it out. It does work for FD and CS. Um, it, it very clearly shows, it very clearly gives higher performance than regular finite difference and even uh, does pretty well compared to analytic derivatives uh, for cheap codes. You, you wouldn't want to use this. Please do not try our coloring algorithm on your CFD code, <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> Uh, use Sandy's algorithm that he published for parallel coloring. Um, but if you want to use it on your Dimos ODE, assuming that you're not Graham trying to do 5 million states, then go ahead. Um, the, one, the one caveat I have with this is if you're not using complex step, I think the coloring could end up being a little bit noisy. And by noisy, I mean either it doesn't get quite as good of a coloring as you'd want, which is like okay, but not great or noisy in that you get incorrect coloring, which means your partial derivatives are wrong, which is like bad, very, very bad. Um, like bad finite difference derivatives are like worse than no derivatives. Um, so one of the things that I'm worried about in general, which will go for all of these tools, is we need to provide the user a way to like see if this is good, see if these derivatives make sense, which ultimately is, in this context means comparing the colored versus the non-colored finite difference and kind of making sure that for the same step size that you're getting the same answer for that particular number. Um, Tim, Tim very kindly said that he thought our check partials capability worked okay. 
but we're gonna have to extend that a bit to make those checks work in a coloring context. So that I think is gonna take some effort to get right. Um, another potential roadblock with this partial derivative coloring, coloring stuff, or at least not roadblock, but thing I'm concerned about is that um, there's some overhead with the coloring, not just using it, but like computing the coloring for the first time. And so it could be the situation where there's like some break even point where, you know, like for if your if your number of if your vector size is like 10, it doesn't make sense, but it makes sense at 11 beyond. Um, it, it may or may not be important for me, for us to, to help users understand where that trade is or, or whether they can just try it with it on and try it with it off and see which one's faster. Maybe, maybe that's okay. It's not completely clear to me, but, um, and then there are some details like, do you do the coloring on the class? I, I'm skipping over the implementation of how you do this, but how, do you do the coloring on the class? And then when you stamp out 50 instances of it, the coloring is valid? Or does each one of those instances have some option that changes it such that you have to color each instance separately? Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is this isn't a panacea, right? Like I, I, I give you this functionality and it doesn't just make it so you never have to do derivatives, but it should at least make it easier to, to prototype. Um, I'm just concerned about the details of like, are, am I using something or have I built a feature that like no, only like one user will ever be able to, to take advantage of unless they happen to, to know exactly what's going on. Basically, unless I help you, are you able to use this? So I'm worried about that. Um, one of the reasons I think it, we've been spending so much time on getting this coloring right is that I think it'll be important when we do have AD that this coloring algorithm is, is well hashed out, uh, both in terms of like the checking functionality and the performance checking and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's sort of been a precursor for us to make sure we had it right. Um, basically, if you're using this coloring with complex step, you, you're basically doing forward AD already. So I guess kind of we already have AD. Um, but it won't work very efficiently if you really needed a reverse mode AD is the, is the caveat there. So that, that brings us to the, to the next one, which is algorithmic differentiation for partial derivatives. I'd, I'd love to get here. I, I guarantee you it's going to take us more than a year to get it right. Um, it's not even clear whether we should be using source code transformation or operator overloading AD at the moment. Um, I can also guarantee you that there's, pro like if you want to use it, there's probably going to be some coding practices that you have to adopt that you may or may not be use, used to. Uh, so this introduces like a whole new training kind of like overhead to the thing. So I, my gut feeling is that we'll develop this and use it in-house and we'll make it available to you guys, but it, like it's just kind of going to be used at your own risk. Um, and if you want to give it a try, hopefully you'll help us improve it. Uh, like I said, there's there's still a lot of open uh, open questions, even fundamental ones like which AD library should we use, or, or in fact, do we tie ourselves to one AD library, or do we find a way to open it up? Our current our current prototype of this actually involves us doing some pre-parsing of the code to convert it from like standard OpenMDO code where to something that your typical AD system could actually handle. Uh, so there's there's a lot involved there. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I just think we're going to, we'll probably f focus mainly on the coloring and the partial derivatives and the CS and get that right. Um, and then when, when we're happy with how that's working, move on, move on to the AD. All right, once again, silence has taken its tacit approval. <laughs> um, I, wish, I wish AD was easier for Python. I think the flexibility of the language is really what bites us here. But the one saving grace is that OpenMDO kind of forces you to be a little bit more rigid. There's basically one function that we need to AD inside of a class. And so as long as you don't do any side effect things and are a little bit careful with how you use your objects and attributes, it's probably doable in, in our context. That's always going to be the case, yeah. Right. But what I'm talking about is like, sometimes it's easy, like in Python, it's really easy to write a function that has side effects on the object. So like, as part of this function, it changes the state of some variable that the AD can't track, uh, or calls some other function that changes the state of the object. 
Um, you can call them nested functions, yeah. Right. So AD works fine. That's a good way to put it. AD works fine for functions, but it struggles with methods. The, um, but that's just a that's like an inherent feature of AD. That's not like right. Yeah. So the flexibility of Python is that like a lot of people's code maybe has those kinds of methods where they like track state or things like that, and you to use AD effectively, you have to like give up some of the flexibility of Python and not do some of the cooler or cuter, cuter stuff because it makes your AD unhappy. Um, the other big challenge with AD and Python is NumPy and SciPy. Everybody uses NumPy and SciPy, but that gives some AD codes trouble and some not. So um, I think the easiest solution would be to, it, like, I, I think in the short term, if you really wanted AD and you weren't happy with our implementation or it's not ready, I actually think you should try out some of the stuff that Andrew Ning is going to show you guys tomorrow because Julia has a much much more robust AD community around it. Um, so that may be like another option for if you want to do AD um, is to try out the Julia bridge that we've written for OpenMDAO, at least in the short term. I'm pretty committed to AD in Python in the, in the middle term. Any other comments on AD or partial derivative stuff? Um, please try out our colored partial derivative stuff. Also, please let us know if it's not working for you. Um, the, the, the stuff we've tried so far has all worked pretty well. But. All right. Uh, this is the part that I actually expect to take the most time with, so we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so obviously, number one, I think I'm going to try and host this workshop every year. Uh, at one point, there was discussion about maybe hosting it in Europe in alternating years. I don't know if that'll happen. Um, but I, I think it'll be value added to the community. I think you guys can let me know if you disagree to, to try and host this every year. So um, we'll probably try to start the planning for that right away. Um, the second thing is poems. Now. Uh, poem stands for, you can thank Brett, he came up with poem. He really, really wanted to tell people that they had to write poems <laughs> when they ask for features. But poem, you know, stands for acronym, whatever, typical government stuff. We, we cherry picked the letters we wanted out of the words, but proposal for open, open MDO enhancement, and that's the poems. Um, this process is loosely based on how Python does their PEPs, Python enhancement processes, so we took a lot of inspiration from that. I spent a good bit of time looking at some different models for different um, open source projects, but in the end, I decided that something similar to the PEP process was, was going to work well. Um, there's been a new repository, so I don't know how many of you have already gotten to this or not. So this exists. Um, with at least the current version, uh, there's a template, and then this first poem is the definition of all the other poems. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to read all of this to you. I, I'll ask you guys to homework, go read it, and then talk to me about it tomorrow. Um, oh wait. I thought I pushed. I thought I pushed the version that had this poem removed. Now, now I'm going to get in trouble. We we talked about it and decided that you shouldn't actually put poetry in the poems. So now now I'm going to get in trouble for not keeping this up to date. The version on my computer doesn't have that poem. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. <laughs> I'm in I'm in really big trouble now. <laughs> um, I I think the key part of poems that I want to talk about is uh, well first of all. Again, we are answerable to NASA projects funding us. So the dev team reserves the, the final and sole right to decide which poems are accepted and which are rejected. Um, in other words, uh, while we really want community contribution and are open to these poems, ultimately we're the ones who are going to decide whether a poem, like even if every single person in the community wants a poem, like everybody says you must have a better genetic algorithm, if if the if we don't have the funding to do it, we're just not going to do it, right? So, yeah. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> Part of it is generating community support. <laughs> so, 
No, including actual poetry will not affect the probability that the poem is accepted. However, however, including a reference implementation with your poem will affect the probability that your poem is accepted. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you, you get fake internet points for writing poetry in your poems. It, <laughs> Andrew. All right, good questions. Let's start with issues. Uh, we talked about whether we should just use issues. However, the reason there's two reasons we shouldn't use issues. One, uh, Microsoft owns GitHub, and I do not trust Microsoft. So I didn't want this process to be logged in only a way that is, is owned by their servers. So that's paranoid answer. Um, the second one, though, is that when you submit a poem, uh, as Elliot alluded to, one of the things you're responsible for as the author of that poem is listening to community input, right? Whether that community is, uh, Carolina writes a poem uh, and, and the devs make some comments, but maybe Eric makes some comments or you make some comments. She's the author of the poem, so she retains the right to decide what to do with those comments. But one of the ways that you could comment would be to submit a pull request to her branch of the poem. So maybe you really liked her idea and wanted to become a co-author on the poem and made a bunch of edits or gave her a reference implementation. So you submit a pull request to her branch of the poem. So that's, why, that's practically why it can't be an issue, because I wanted a way for somebody who wasn't the author of the poem to actually edit the poem. Um, why is it different from a pull request to open MDAO? There's two reasons. One, I wanted a process where people could submit poems if they chose before, like querying the dev team, would you like it if we did this, or is this a good idea? And I didn't feel like pull requests were the right venue for that. Um, and two, I didn't th think pull requests offered quite the amount of flexibility that we wanted in terms of like editing and, and associating um, like headers and, and tracking state and things like that. So there was, there was enough of additional process that like I could envision at some point, for example, writing a CI system that checks the validity of the structure of this document and things like that. And, and it's really hard to do that on, on just pure PRs. So there was enough of a reason. Um, a corollary to that is, should poems be in the main OpenMDO repo or a separate repo? Uh, again, we, we erred on separate repo because one, that's what Python does, and two, if the CI system for this starts to diverge heavily from OpenMDO, I didn't want cross-contamination. There is not currently any CI system for this, but I, I do envision such a system in the future. Is everything on GitHub archived somewhere else on another server? Uh, not like, not like by default, but yes, it's they're just Git repos, so yes, like like GitHub doesn't guarantee that, but but we all keep copies of the repositories. Um, so, yeah, I I put a I put a, a good bit of thought into these rules for these poems. That that doesn't mean that I got everything right or that I I'm not open to changing them, um, but I tried to explicitly deal with a lot of issues. Like I thought about what happens if, you know. Rob doesn't like the poem I wrote and thinks it should be done differently, so I've, I've addressed like competing poems. Um, I've tried to make it clear who has final authority, so it's really pretty simple. The only people, I will, we will not accept, um, we will never accept pull requests on poems from people who are not the authors of the poem. So basically, if you author a poem, you own that poem. We will never accept pull requests from anybody who's not an author. So that means if you wanna add somebody as an author, the current author will have to first submit a pull request adding them as an author. Uh, so that's, for example, something that I could imagine writing a CI system to enforce, uh, that, that this PR cannot be accepted and is automatically closed because you are not an author of the poem kind of thing. Um, but we should get our feelings hurt because it ultimately, you're the benevolent dictators. Well, what I'm talking about now is when somebody submits a poem, who has the authority to edit that poem? Oh. That is separate from who has the authority to accept or reject a poem, and that Rely, that lies solely in the benevolent dictators of the dev team. Um, we are the sole group with the authority to accept or reject poems. I've also tried to deal explicitly with what happens when we reject your poem. And this is something that I actually do think is important to talk about. There's a bunch of reasons why we might reject your poem. Maybe we just don't like you. Uh, but more probably, it's a really good idea, 
that we don't think we can take ownership of the maintenance of, right? And so I'm, I'm really cautious. We have a fixed number of resources. Our dev team is not growing at a, at a rapid pace. And so taking on additional code that we don't feel we can maintain is something we're not willing to do. And so a really good example of, of where this is gonna come up is actually an open pull request right now on a new driver for OpenMDO that deals with differential evolution. It's actually really, it's a nicely written driver. There's a reason, a good reason for why it should be an OpenMDO driver and not just like a generic standalone optimizer. And it's because he's using some of our built-in APIs and stuff for handling parallelization. He was copying some of the functionality out of our design of experiments, basically importing over from that. But I'm not sure that we should accept that pull request because I don't know a lot about differential evolution drivers because they're gradient free methods and I think they're evil. Um, <laughs> But it, but it seems like well-written code. And so I'm, I'm in a little bit of a bind, right? Do I accept it into the main repo, but then trust that this person will always maintain it? Or do I reject it, reject the poem? There isn't a poem written for it yet, but there will be one soon. Reject the poem, uh, but then what do we do? Now, I, now I've said I don't want to accept it into the framework, into the core of OpenMDO, so what do we do then? Uh, so I think that that will ultimately be probably the most common reason that we reject a poem. Right? Not that it wasn't a good idea or that your implementation isn't excellent, uh, but that we don't feel we can you know, take ownership of, of supporting that code. So I think to that point, we might need to build some sort of a plugin system where uh, basically you could distribute this driver as a separate Python package that, your us that users of that package can install. And there's a bit of claptrap that needs to come along with that to figure out like, well, how do I discover these plugins or or how do I test them and link them to versions and things like that? Or how do we activate them? There's a whole bunch of details about plugins. And I am concerned about maintaining a plugin system, adding a lot of additional work to the dev team. So I'll probably be looking for a pretty lightweight starting one. Uh, but I suspect that a lot of functionality is actually going to need to be uh, developed as plugins moving forward. And even some functionality that's currently in OpenMDO, we may choose to move into plugins. Uh, Remy, did you write multi-fidelity Krieging originally? Yeah, you did, right? That, hopefully no offense to you, is something that we're thinking maybe should be moved out of OpenMDO and into a plugin. We did recently do a, a refactor on that, right? Right, Ken, we, we got that done. So we've been doing some maintenance on that code, but we, we don't use that code in-house very often. And so that may be a, another good one to move out into a plugin system. Uh, now, to be fair, that would be a major API change, right? People who previously were using that in OpenMDO would now need to install a plugin. So I will write, I will likely write, at least as a for example, at least as a, as a conceptual example for the audience, this may or may not actually happen. But if I wanted to move that functionality out of OpenMDO and into a plugin, I would write a poem proposing that change, detailing what would happen, and explaining, right, this is the proposed structure for the new plugin. Um, and then hopefully get community feedback. People could say, oh, we're using this all the time. And it turns out a lot of people are using it. And so maybe I decide now it should stay. Or, or maybe it's just total dead silence for three months on the poem. And Remy's just silently emailing me angry uh, death threats. I don't know. But maybe at that point, after a couple of months, I'll make the call whether to accept the poem or not, right? Or the dev team will make the call. So that's kind of how we envision using poems, not just for you guys to propose new features, but for us to communicate our development intent. And that's not to say that we won't also add deprecation warnings and things like that, but uh, writing poems to express what we think are value added additions to the framework or things that we want to remove or API changes, I hope will be a better way to communicate to you guys what we're doing and save everybody a lot of time, right? Because hopefully it's less work to write a poem, get some input, and then change your mind versus prototype a feature and then find out either we're not going to accept it or oh, you know, it turns out the community really doesn't agree with this change that I thought was a great idea, you know, because, you know, nobody's using case recording, so we're just going to rip it out of the framework. <laughs> and so I can write that in a poem, and then everybody can go, oh, no, we use case recording all the time. And then I can say, okay, well, clearly I was wrong. Uh, so we'll reject the poem because we don't want to do it, but at least I saved everybody a lot of effort. Yeah. You can submit a poem at any point. Um, and I tried to explicitly deal with this in the rules. Um, 
Most poems will not get accepted until there's code written, but it's completely reasonable to submit a poem saying like, this is my idea, pretty well fleshed out, devs, what do you think? And if we go, oh, that'd be great. We, would, we don't have time to focus on that, but we would totally accept that PR for this whiz bang new Newton solver that's mathematically correct and doesn't have solved subsystems in it or something. We would absolutely accept that once you figure out how to do it or, or um, maybe a better one would be, oh yeah, we'll definitely take your poem on how to compute second derivatives automatically. Like once you figure that out, we'll totally accept that. Um, and then you haven't written any code, right? But you've, you've like, we've communicated and figured it out and maybe even hashed out an API and had some discussion about where it should be. And then we're still not gonna accept the poem because you owe us an implementation. But at least you know that like we are very interested in that. So that's one way. Uh, another way would be we say, yeah, this is a terrible idea. We thought about that or we tried that. It's not going to work. Reject the poem. We saved you some work. There are even rare cases where like maybe you just think of a better API for dealing with something and you propose that. But it turns out that even though we really agree with your API and think it's great and we want to accept the poem, like implementing that API change requires like changing three quarters, it's just pervasive, right? Like it, it, it spiders across everything and we are gonna take that on. So we may choose to accept a poem without an implementation in, in that case. Uh, and we would hopefully communicate, we would definitely communicate that to you. Like this is great, we really like this API, but we're gonna take care of it. You don't need a reference implementation. Or even thanks for your reference implementation, we're gonna ignore it and do it a different way, but we accept this poem anyway. Uh, so I think all of those situations will happen, but in the vast majority of cases I would expect you write a poem, as long as the reference implementation isn't excessive. It, when you submit the poem, I would hope you have like a flushed out API for it. Like these are the options, these are whatever, these are the arguments to the function, or, or this is the inputs and outputs to the component if you're, suppo if you're su suggesting adding a component to the standard library or to the solver or the driver. With the API flushed out but no reference implementation, you would get a clear indication of yay or nay from the dev team that if we like your implementation, we will accept your, your poem, then you would do the implementation, then we would accept the PR. That, that's how I think most of them will go. Tim. So what, what level of development actually, I guess, requires a, a poem? Like, if I sign like, a two-line bug in the code, and like... Bug fixes never require poems. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. API changes require poems. So if you're adding components to the standard library, if you're changing options, if you're removing components from the standard library, if you're changing the way a driver works fundamentally, like underneath the covers, maybe it's not an API change, but like the way it interacts with MPI is fundamentally changing and could clearly break the way users were doing things before. Um, I think you said it's, you know, you're saying it's the most Sorry, Brett, you said it wouldn't have to be a user-facing change. What, what do you, what do you? You could, you could be re-implementing something down in the depth. It doesn't affect users at all. It would have to be a poem to implement that. Right. So, so anything that's user-facing, definitely poem, right? Because we want to let everybody know that that's what's going on. Even, but if you're going to like go in and, I don't know, invent, like bring your own vector system or something. <laughs> uh, and you have a way that, yeah, he's not listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to like, if you wanted to flesh that out, right? Um, but it wasn't, let's just say hypothetically, it wasn't, it was gonna be done in a way that didn't change the API, which is not possible, but let's just stipulate for the sake of argument that it was. You would still probably wanna do a poem for that. Like you're gonna spend months writing deep inside code that the devs are gonna wanna have input on, right? So user facing changes, API functionality, 100% poem, small bug fixes, Definitely don't need a poem. Um, somewhere in between, like if you're refactoring code for performance or something, probably gonna want a poem. You can always submit one as like safety net, right? Like you could submit a pull request of a bunch of code and we could go, we're not accepting this without a poem. Then you have to go write the poem. Or you could have maybe, or you may submit it and we may say, well, this, this optimization doesn't make sense to us because it targets a very specific use case at a specific scale and it'll break other scales. And then you wasted a bunch of time and I would feel bad telling you we're not gonna take your code, but I'm not gonna take it anyway. I just feel bad. Um, so I guess there's the two extremes, right? Like a two line bug fix, no poem. API changes, definitely poem. Somewhere in between, I mean, just know that we may demand a poem when you submit your pull request and, and kind of use your best judgment. I, 
I'm trying to like walk the line between like as little process as possible and enough process to make this work. So I'd like it to be flexible enough that it can, we'll try it out. And if, if we clearly need some additional rules, we will, but I've tried to leave open, like use your discretion where I could. I think that's the best way to do it for now. Yeah, Gary. We, I'm, I'm committing to writing poems for API, user-facing API changes, yes. Are you going to tie it to uh, release cycles, as in poems 5, 7, 9 are open for comments until 3.10, and will be implemented by 3.11 or something like that? I haven't thought about it that far. That's not a bad suggestion. Uh, at the moment, I was thinking poems would stay open until I decided to close them. Um, and they would, whenever a poem was closed and the PR accepted and, and the feature added, it would just make it into the next release. I, I'm not sure that that's the best idea. Maybe, maybe you're right, maybe tying it to release numbers. As, at one point in the past, we tried to do like monthly releases. So tying it to release numbers would like assign a certain window of time to it. We haven't been following that as closely lately. Or, so, or that's yeah. in the release notes, okay. At the, at the very least, the release notes will tell you which poems were put in that release. And then what we could do is like write a page where you could go look at see which ones are currently like in which states or something. So that you could quickly see, oh, these are things that are potentially up for grabs. But you're right, maybe it would be useful to understand like, oh, these ones are, well, so I mean, what I did was I created a bunch of states. So there's like proposed, and then there's accepted, where are the states? Thank you. So there's active, which means somebody, the author submitted the poem. There's requesting decision, which means the author of the poem is done and would like a ruling. Um, then there's accepted or rejected, which will come in reasonable time from requesting decision. Uh, reasonable time is purposely vague. <laughs> um, and then integrated means like whatever, whatever feature has actually been described has been added. And so I guess what you're looking for is like a list of things that have been accepted but not yet integrated and some map of when they would get in. I do. Yeah, well, I, 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 if I write a poem, I do. I expect poem authors to be open to other people's input. If, if there's an author who's like actively telling people, go away, I don't want your help with this poem, and those other people are, are being productive and trying to help, it's not, it's very likely not gonna be accepted in that case. Plugins folder. Oh, well, we can t we can talk about this more offline. Well, what I had envisioned was just straight up plugins are just going to be separate Python packages, and you would just manage them with the standard Python packaging system. Uh, but if if you if you want to propose an alternate, let, let's talk about it. Let's. I'm open to to figuring out what would work best. Um, yeah. You want a tagging system? Yeah. You can write a poem to propose a tagging system for poems. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think it's a good suggestion. I'm confident that that's too much overhead for us to use spooling it up, though. Um, I'm not even sure like what what tags I would create other than like the couple of you, you described. Um, I hope that there's not so many poems that like this is an issue. To be frank, like. So that I did deal with that situation. There's in the header, there's competing poems and related poems, and it's the poems, auth poem author's responsibility to check those off. So like, if you submitted a poem and, I, and I've read it and I say, this is closely related to this other poem, 
in a comment, I would expect you to PR and add that ID in the, so that, that was kind of how I was envisioning this cross-referencing working in the beginning. To, I, I could be wrong about this. Ignoring the initial transient where every single one of you goes home tonight and writes a poem just to make my life difficult, <laughs> get back at me for version zero and version one. Um, neglecting that, I'm anticipating like on the order of 10 to 15 poems a year total, most of which would come from us. Uh, that's kind of my guesstimate. So some of like the need to organize and like search poems when there's only 10 of them open at any one point in time is I think a little bit less. So I, I kind of like, like what's the minimum possible amount of structure I can put on this and I'll add more when it, like if it turns out we're getting 50 poems a year that are legitimate that need to be dealt with, then, then maybe we need to, to add another layer, right? Um, but that's, Partly because I'm concerned about like adding these poems is going to add a little bit of friction to the development process for us. It's a lot harder for us to like write the poem and keep track of everything. So I'm, I'm trying to minimize the impact of the dev team as much as possible, um, including like I don't want to go spend three months like writing a poem system. Uh, so for the most part, our initial cut at this is just going to be managing everything through the repo and we'll see how that works. And when it's clear that that's not working, we'll, we'll add some more stuff on top of it at, at that point. Okay, so homework, <laughs> read the poem. Read poem 000. I will, my homework is like, as soon as I'm done here, I have to push the latest version. So I will, I will do that. Um, please, please read the poem. If not tonight, because you're busy participating in a human experiment, unsanctioned human experiment. Um, it, when you go home, read it. Feel free to submit pull requests or comments on the, on the poem uh, to improve it if there's something you really want or write a poem, a new poem if you want. Like I said, we'll be writing a, a couple of poems in the next month or two ourselves.